Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Good evening, and welcome to Join the Discussion, a monthly show about healthy aging and wellness. My name is Madeline Franchese. I am the Vice President of Marketing and Development for Huber Healthcare, and I will be your host. Thanks for joining us tonight. Tonight, I'm joined by, with Brian Pelletier, Director of Pharmacy Services at Hebrew Healthcare. Brian has 12 years of pharmaceutical experience with a specialty focus in geriatrics. By the end of tonight's show, we hope that everyone who's watching is going to be able to be better consumer health advocates for themselves and their loved ones around pharmaceutical needs. Thanks for joining us, Brian. Thank you. I'm gonna start with a few statistics and I won't <laughs> be surprised if you already know them. Um, according to the CDC, 48% of the people use at least one prescription drug in the past 30 days. 22% of the people use three or more prescription drugs in the past 30 days. And according to the Henry J. Kaiser Family Foundation, this, this statistic was staggering, more than 4 billion prescriptions were filled at retail pharmacies in 2014. When I heard all of those statistics, clearly one of the most important members of the healthcare team is your pharmacist. But I'm going to guess that most people don't even speak to their pharmacist, never mind know their pharmacist if they're using mail order or going to a large pharmaceutical chain. So pharmacists do more than just dispense medication. And given the backdrop of how many people rely on pharmaceuticals, what else? Let's talk about pharmacy and, pharma and pharmacists in general. But I want to start first with your credentials. What does BCGP mean? And what's the special training that you get for being that, having that geriatric focus? So that particular one is board certified geriatric pharmacist. And within pharmacy, there are several different specialties or credentials that you can get. This one is tailored more for geriatrics. So we have additional training and education that we have to go through that's specific for older adults and people over 65 years of age. And, and in part, that's because older people process medication differently as their body's changing. I mean, what are you learning? that's different than an 18 month old taking Tylenol. Right, so, so part of it is that there's more medications that an older adult might be taking. And uh, based on different rates right now, every day there's 10,000 people that are turning 65. And so the number is staggering and that part of the population is growing very quickly. Mm -hmm. So there's gonna be more people over 65 years of age and they're taking more prescriptions. And so for pharmacists, it's important that we have specialized training in order to care for those people better. Would you say most pharmacists have this specialty focus or is it mostly for pharmacists who work in a long-term care setting or a facility setting? It doesn't necessarily matter what setting they're in. Uh, there are pharmacists that are in different care settings that are board certified as well. Mm -hmm. And it's just depending on, on what you are working in specifically and if that's something that you want to go forward with. If your pharmacist doesn't have the certification, seek some, talk to your doctor some more. Doesn't matter, trust your pharmacist still. I mean, where do you... Well, if you look at the, the last several years, pharmacists and nurses are usually top two, three of the most trusted professions. Mm -hmm. and, and while there might not be someone that you go to at your local pharmacy who is board certified, they're certainly dealing with older adults all mm -hmm. the time. So they have a, a background. Um, let's, let's now uh, dive deeper into, d besides dispensing medication, you know, my view of pharmacists are, you know, you count and you put them in the, 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 the container. 
but the pharmacist really is the conduit, not only between the patient and the doctor and the insurance. And so what else should we be looking to our pharmacist to do? Well, the dispensing part is, is a small piece, as you said, of, of what the responsibilities are. And depending on the care setting, which I'll go into a little bit mm -hmm. further, it, they might be doing something different. So if you are going to your community pharmacy, that's your local pharmacy that most people are familiar with, they're going to be doing some of the dispensing, mm -hmm. but they also have immunization training. So they could be giving vaccines for the flu vaccine, for the shingles vaccine, mm -hmm. or for the pneumococcal, something to help with prevent pneumonia. Mm -hmm. And that's one particular area that, that they will be working in. They also are doing something called medication therapy management. So mm -hmm. they're getting to work with the different patients that are coming or the consumers that are coming and do cons consultations and talking to them about their medications. They're also, as you said, they are the, that bridge between the physician's office and the insurance company. And unfortunately, in a lot of cases, we're stuck in the middle mm. and, and trying to advocate for the consumer to get the medication that they need to have. And this could be a stressful situation, not only for the pharmacist, but also for the patient that's coming into the pharmacy needing this particular medication and they can't get it because right. the insurance isn't paying for it. So we help to bridge that gap and working with the physician's office as well as with the insurance. And tied into that, there's also some, some reviews that we'll do with the insurance company to help with getting the medications covered. So that's the the short version of the community pharmacist. Okay. There's also pharmacists that are in long-term care facilities mm -hmm. or dispensing to long-term care facilities, and those are consultant pharmacists. So based on what a patient would need or a, a resident would need in long-term care facility, they need to have the chart reviewed every 30 days. So a pharmacist will go in, they'll review the chart, making sure that they're on the appropriate medications, that there is an appropriate reason to be on the medications, mm -hmm. and that there's no drug interactions. Okay. And, and that person's also working very closely with the nurse and with the physician or a nurse practitioner, depending on, on who is going to be in that, that particular setting, and trying to make sure that medications are used appropriately. The th the th sorry, the third is in the hospital pharmacist. And so similar to what we're doing at the Hospital Hebrew Healthcare, so we have pharmacists that are, that are part of the multidisciplinary team or the mm -hmm. interdisciplinary team. So again, we're working very closely with nurses, with physicians, <coughs> with social workers to make sure that the, the right medication is getting to the right patient at the right time. And so that, there's the dispensing part, which is, like I said, a small component. There's also what we call a clinical components to what our responsibilities are as well. So we might be doing something with use of antibiotics in some of the, our hospitals will be part of this stewardship team that helps to prescribe medication and use antibiotics appropriately so that people are on, again, the right antibiotic for the right amount of time. Okay. And we have different agreements with medical practices where pharmacists can actually prescribe medications. So we could be prescribing something like warfarin that's mm -hmm. used for some heart disease, and the, the pharmacist has the ability to change doses, has the ability to order labs. And I think those are things that people mm. don't quite see when you're going to your local pharmacy. Correct. And, and as well in the, the hospital setting, we're also verifying and reviewing medications for their appropriate dosing. Okay. And a lot of times the consumer would never see an, an intervention that a pharmacist would make. It would never even make it that far. Interventions such as finding, God forbid, medicine, mistakes in the list or dosage errors or duplications, those kind of reconciliations? Right, so we're looking at the appropriate of, appropriateness of that medication. So okay. is, is it dosed correctly for this person's kidney function? Mm -hmm. Is it too high a dose? Is it too low a dose? And we're making recommendations in real time to prevent any risk of adverse events from occurring. Okay. Yeah. And, and so very closely tied to all of this is something called medication reconciliation. And we do that mostly in the, the hospital setting. But we're looking at these, the transitions of care. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the most important times and the highest risk of 
errors or discrepancies to occur with medications. So you have a situation where someone maybe is referred to the Hospital for Senior Care at Huber Healthcare. They come in for treatment, um, and at that point, your bedside, looking at the medication list, you're looking at the chart, is that where you come into the picture? Right, so we're looking at the medications on admission mm -hmm. and making sure that the medications that are supposed to be ordered are being prescribed for that particular person. And if something isn't ordered, there's a reason for it. Mm -hmm. And if there's something that should be added, then we'll be making those recommendations. I mean, a, a quick personal story mm -hmm. on this. Several years ago, and this might be this might sound familiar to, to a lot of people, but my, my grandfather was living at home. He was having s multiple falls. Mm -hmm. you know, we spent, uh, the family spent about two years. The, the siblings mm -hmm. would take weekly shifts it would help him with food, make sure that he's eating, make, help him with, uh, with medications as well, making sure he's taking the medications. Mm -hmm. and, and then despite several falls, he had multiple admissions to the hospital. We had to make the difficult decision that he should be in a long-term care facility or, or a nursing home. So we made that transition to go in the nursing home. And after a couple of months, he developed pneumonia, went back into the hospital. And so we do see some people going back and forth from home to mm -hmm. hospital, maybe to the nursing home. And, and so he goes back to the hospital and he comes back. And unfortunately at the time, he- He comes it, back to the nursing home. Correct, yeah. So thank you. And no. so, so he, <laughs> but that's, that's why it's confusing, exactly. right? Because people can go to multiple different areas different settings and so he comes back he's more tired he's more confused and so I'm trying to get the med list from my family to see what medications now he's on and now now everyone you're the you're on the speed dial we'll yeah. call Brian right, right. <laughs> and so it took two three weeks and mm -hmm. I remember it vividly because it was it was Thanksgiving Day they were <sighs> visiting at visiting at the the home and or at the nursing home and we had FaceTime. So we had, we had the, the computer or the, the Apple product, whatever you want to say, right? <laughs> and we were talking to my grandfather, talking to family, and then I asked him to get that med list. So they show me on the computer, here's the, the And list. you're asking your family, not the nursing Correct. facility. Right. Wouldn't the nursing facility have the med list too? Well, part of it is since my family was there, okay. I, I had the ability to ask them but if, okay, but if it wasn't but if you're not a pharmacist and you don't have that correct. inside information you should be asking the nursing correct okay. correct so i looked i looked at the medication and saw something very quickly that didn't look correct mm. and so that then prompted like as you were mentioning a conversation with the nurse mm. so they realized very quickly that this drug was not the right dose oh my god and so what it was very confusing though because what happened is he was on a half tablet of a particular medication, went into the hospital and somewhere between going and coming back, it was now mistakenly a whole tablet. Mm. So he was getting twice as much as he should of this particular medication. So there was something we were able to identify and then change it back to what it was supposed to be. And then there was a little bit, there was an a improvement in, in his, uh, his cognition. So he wasn't as confused. Mm -hmm. He was a little bit more awake. And I think that was one of the reasons that we were all able to see him and be all together for the holidays. Mm. And potentially that would not have happened if, mm. if we weren't able to identify it earlier. So you also made a good point that not everyone has a nurse <laughs> or a physician or a pharmacist in the family. And I don't think you want me to pull up your cell phone number for right. the West Hartford community, right? right? <laughs> yeah. okay, so, <laughs> so part of it is, while you may not know the specific drugs and maybe the doses, I think it's important to know what questions to ask. Okay, so what uh, questions would you ask? What are so, the questions? Uh, so I was trying to think, what's a good analogy? So if you go to get your car repaired, mm -hmm. right, you're not going to leave without having any conversation about what they did. Correct. So they might have done an oil change or they changed a filter, right? And these are changes that they're going to be communicating with you afterwards. Mm -hmm. So likewise, if we extrapolate that to leaving the hospital, you should be asking similar questions of what changes were made. Oh, good, good point. So if someone had some medications that were decreased or increased, that should be communicated and we should be asking as the consumer mm -hmm. several questions. So one of them is going to be what medications were changed, if it was an increase or decrease, what medications should be continued when, when I, once I go home, what medications were stopped, mm. and what medications were started. 
we, we see often that someone might go home and they could take the lower dose and then the new higher dose and they're taking twice as much of a medication as they should be Ugh. because it is, it is an extremely confusing time. It's very stressful exactly. you're in the hospital and now you're going home. You just want to get out. <laughs> right, right. And, but now you're home and you have maybe new, several new medications. Mm. And so it's trying to figure out, okay, well, how can you go through each of these and, and make sure that you have the right list of medications so that you're not causing any harm? Because you're not necessarily post uh, discharge going to go see your primary care person who may say, give me your med list from the hospital, let me make sure. You almost right. have to be your own advocate, which is what this is about, teaching people. Um, and, I, and I'm gonna, some of these questions are so wonderful, maybe what we can do if people would like um, some, a list of these questions, we can have it available. People could email us and join the discussion at HebrewHealthCare.org, and mm -hmm. maybe we could produce a list for people to sure. help them. Um, that would be great. Now, you covered the person maybe who's under care, what should we be doing about our own medication list? Like, should I be having my medication list on me? You so know, the short answer would be yes. And I think everyone should carry a list person. of medication on them. Mm -hmm. Right. And kind of have to look at it. Some people might get very, very into it, if you want to say. And yes. And they'll, they'll create a typed up list and they'll laminate it. <laughs> And you have to look at, well, if I have a, a change to that, how quickly mm. or how much time would it take for me to update it? Mm. So if you're not going to update the list, then you have to actually think about what kind of format mm -hmm. of the list that you're going to be using. And if you have a change or a new medication added, maybe a handwritten note would be the best. Mm -hmm. And like you said, we want to make sure that we're bringing that to the physician's office. Okay. So if you look back 25, 30 years ago, most people might have had a primary care physician and maybe one specialist. Exactly. And we fast forward to today, <laughs> and so someone could have a primary care, a cardiologist, endocrinologist, a neurologist, et cetera, et cetera. And so- And not all of those people are even geriatric trained on top of that. Correct. Which adds another element. It certainly does. But tied to that, they may not be in the same organization mm -hmm. or tied to the same group, and even if they are, we don't always have a good way to communicate some of these, this information in a streamlined way. So having that list, you can go to the primary care physician and, and say, this is my updated med list, and certainly want to keep it current. But then you go to the cardiologist, you want to also provide that medication list mm -hmm. so that, that if they are asking about or wanting to add new medications, that they know what else you're on to prevent any interactions. Okay. No, that's... <laughs> How often should we be cleaning out our medicine chest and the yearly checkup of our own medication? Where are you disposing of it? I know there are drop-off sites, but you know, usually you decide to clean your medicine chest out when you don't have those drop-off dates. Right, right. So talk a little bit about that and maybe and so, expiration dates. Right. So, <laughs> so for, for the medications that you, that you have, I mean, typically things you may not use all of it. And so we want to make sure that what current meds that you are on is what you have in your, in your medicine cabinet. And we really shouldn't have some of the extra medications in there, but we know that everyone pretty much does have that. Right, right? exactly. And, and so there are a few different ways to dispose of them. So you could go to the local police department and they do have a drop box for for medications and prescriptions. Uh, you could have, like you mentioned as well, there are drop off days. Mm -hmm. and so. Every few months, there'll be a, a location where people could go and drop off any of their medications that they're no longer using. And what you want to make sure that if you have the bottle, you really want to cross off your name, mm. cross off any identifiable information, and then that particular bottle could go into the regular trash. Okay. But talking about medication lists a little bit, we, were, we mentioned earlier, when you're looking at medications that you're on, that list should include several different parts of it or pieces of information. Right, so it should have what the medication name is, what the dose is. Oof. Right, it's a so lot you of can't just say a little pink pill. I mean, obviously you need to know the name because there could be 17 little pink pills. Right. Yeah. But some of these names are not so easy to say, remember, pronounce. Right. And, and so maybe... That's the list. Yeah. <laughs> so you have the list and you'll be able to, to see the name. You may not be able to pronounce it, but at least you'll see what it is and can match it up with the bottle. Mm -hmm. but you'll have the dose. You'll have what the directions are. You also want to have the reason you're taking it. 
And you don't need necessarily need to put some complex medical mm -hmm. term. You could have sugars if it's something for diabetes. Got it. You could have heart. Doesn't matter what it why? is. Why? Just so you remember what it's for. I mean, why would you put that down there? Yeah, so it'll be easier for the for the patient to understand what medication is being used for. Because mm -hmm. not everyone will know what some particular heart failure mm -hmm. is, and so putting that it's heart then it'll make it easier for them to know very quickly why they're using it. Okay. We also want to make sure that we have the, the pharmacy that you're using mm -hmm. and having that pharmacy number. Okay. There's countless times we'll, we'll meet with someone and we'll ask the pharmacy and they're like, well, it's this pharmacy on this street and, or it's this pharmacy in this town. And right. we don't necessarily know which one it is because there could be several. Mm. And so having that number will make it a little bit easier for the pharmacist you're working with or with the nurse if you see a nurse at the physician's office to make that phone call to clarify anything that they would okay. need. Yeah, you could also include all of the providers you're seeing. Mm -hmm. So if there are three or four providers, you could have each of their names and that contact information in case of an emergency, someone would have that information. If you wanted to, you could even have a little picture of what the pill looks like. Correct. So that you could match it up if you needed to. Right. And so we've also seen, mm -hmm. like you said, the yellow pill and then if it has some identifiable right number or something you could put that number on the problem with that is that there are products that are made from different companies and you could potentially get the same drug but made from a different company mm -hmm. that has a different color because mm. we'll get questions of well last week i was taking the white pill right and, and now it's yellow and it's a different oh. shape that's so it can be name. very confusing. The name is critical then. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. What's the best place to store your medication? Well, I think, I think it's easier to say maybe where not to store okay. it. Okay, <laughs> where right? shouldn't we be so storing it? So you it? shouldn't be storing it in the, the bathroom. Where <laughs> Which there's is a lot where of... every medicine <laughs> chest is, Brian. Right, right. So that, there's a lot of humidity yeah. when, if you're taking a shower, mm -hmm. and that might affect how well the medication is working. And wow. You also don't want to have the medication in your car for a similar reason. If it's a hot, humid day, mm -hmm. then it, it may affect how, how well that medication is, is working. So what I would recommend is putting the medications in a place that you'll remember to take them. So for example, if you in the morning like to have a cup of coffee or you like mm -hmm. to read a, the paper and you have a very specific spot where the coffee maker is, mm -hmm. you could leave the medications close to that or in a cabinet higher above it so that you remember and you can connect that, okay, coffee and or newspaper and taking the medications. Because mm -hmm. we also want to make sure that you're, that we're all remembering to take the medications. And so if you don't have a, a system or a consistent way that you're going to be doing that, then we may forget. Right. So is everybody listening to this now going upstairs and emptying their medicine chest? I mean, I want to just back up for that for just a second on that point. Should we be? I mean, should we really be putting in our medicine chest non-prescription drugs? Is Tylenol okay to keep there, or do you classify them all together, not in the bathroom? For, from my perspective, I would classify them all mm. together. So whether it's a prescription, an over-the-counter product, an herbal product, those to me are all medications, and, and it'd be easier to store those in, in one place. And we didn't even talk about that, but when you're creating this medication list, you should include supplements, vitamins, any herbal, anything you're taking, correct? That's correct. And part of it is because there are interactions with an mm. over-the-counter counter product. You mentioned Tylenol. And so there are products or medications that have Tylenol in it, mm. and it's a combination product. <laughs> so if you're taking this combination product with Tylenol and then separately taking Tylenol from it in and of itself, you could be getting too much of a medication. What if I forget to take my medication? Do you automatically say, oh, well, I forgot, or you know, if it's an hour, fine. If it's seven hours later, call your doctor, call your pharmacist, don't call anybody, skip a day. <laughs> What do you do there? It, it, there's not I mean, it uh, necessarily on the medication. I correct. Assume. Right. So, so if it's if it's close to when you're supposed to take it, you can go ahead and, and take mm -hmm. it. Now, if it's like you said, seven, twelve hours later, then you would likely maybe want to to wait and and take it the the next day. Now, if if you think, well, maybe I'll just take two, 
that not necessarily is going to be the, the best choice. Okay. And I would suggest not taking two. <laughs> Better to skip than take two of anything. Correct, because it might have an additive effect. All right. And there we go again. say it's something for blood pressure that w would may may potentially lower your blood pressure too much. And so mm -hmm. we'd want to, in that case, you could call the physician, you could mm -hmm. call a pharmacist and just check with them and say, is it okay to, to hold it? Because I, I think at the end of the day, mm -hmm. it's okay to ask the question. Right, exactly. And I think that's part of the message we're trying to provide to people, no matter who the guest is, that we are stewards of our own healthcare and advocates. And we have to know information, but if we don't, we have to not be afraid to ask mm -hmm. because it is about us. Um, we're already coming to the end. This has gone by so quickly. Um, I'm trying to end every show um, by asking the guests to provide three tips um, to the audience and for your area about uh, a pharmacy. Um, so it would be like three tips you'd give your own parents. Mm -hmm. You know, the three golden rules from your perspective, if you wouldn't mind. What would they be? I think you already touched upon some of them just now, but it's asking questions. And so not being afraid to ask those questions. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe the perception is that, well, this person is really busy. Mm -hmm. I don't want I don't, I don't want to take their time. But if, if you don't ask that question, then you're not going to know. And you could put yourself at harm or potentially in harm by, by not asking some of these important questions. So if you're, say you're hospitalized and you're going home, then we should really be asking, what medications were changed? Mm -hmm. is, is there something that's new? Is there something that I should be stopping? All right. And then in terms of the medication lists, we want to have what medications are on that list. It's the most current uh, list that we can be using. And we want to make sure that we're going to keep it current and keep it updated. Is there anything we left out? I know we only have a few moments and I'm going to sign off, but I think we've covered most of the things, the future mm -hmm. of pharmacy. So I, I think a big thing with pharmacists right now is when you go to the pharmacy, you're asking them a question, they're not getting reimbursed or paid for that. So mm. going... They're not really providers, if you will, correct. in that regard. Right. So there's something called mm. the provider status and we're, the pharmacists are trying to, to get provider status through Medicare to be able to bill for some of the services that we have. So the med reconciliation, for example, you don't get reimbursed for. Correct. And when you think about all the statistics and all the people coming your way, I could see why <laughs> as an industry you're starting to look at that. Right, and we, we talked about how pharmacists do more than dispensing. So we're right. prescribing medica medications in several several settings and and so we are definitely a, an important part of the interdisciplinary team without a doubt i want to thank you for being here today brian and for all you do um again if anyone in the audience has some questions for brian please email us at join the discussion at hebrewhealthcare.org also if you would like to provide future topics or if you'd like the uh list of uh, questions. Not only can you get it through the email, again, join the discussion at HebrewHealthCare.org, but we will post it on our Facebook page as well. Until next month, thank you for joining us and have a good day.